think the first question, and I have, and like to ask would be, how did you meet LBJ? And what were your experiences with LBJ? Of course, uh, everyone in Texas uh, knew that uh, Lyndon Johnson was a premier political figure in Texas. But when I was in the uh, Texas State Senate, I served in the Senate from January of 1967 until 1972 when I went to the Congress. While I was a member of the Texas Senate, Lyndon Johnson was president of this country. And I received a telegram at my home in Houston from Lyndon Johnson. And the telegram was to the effect, we're having a meeting at the White House and uh, are having uh, several people to discuss the future of a bill which was pending in the Congress this bill was regarding changes in housing legislation to infuse that legislation with a civil rights component. And this telegram asked if I would meet at the White House to discuss this legislation. And it concluded, present this telegram at the some gate of the White House. Well, I was, of course, quite startled to receive a telegram from the President of the United States asking that I come to Washington to talk about anything. And uh, I said, well, I, I guess I will go. And I took the telegram when I, I was in Houston, when I received the telegram, came back to Austin for the Senate and showed it to my colleagues in the Senate. I said, you see, I've got an invitation to go to Washington. And uh, they were kind of excited about just the prospect. Now at the time, John Connolly was governor of Texas and I hadn't had very good relations with uh, Mr. Connolly, but here was this invitation to the White House, so I went. And I, uh, at that time, you would fly to, to Washington, to Dulles Airport, and then you would take a limousine, which is really a bus, to uh, 12th and K Streets at the Albert Pick Motel, a hotel, and uh, then you take a taxi to where you wanted to go. So I flew to Washington. I got the bus to the Albert Pick. I took my uh, bag, or I didn't have, I wasn't staying overnight, so I didn't have much luggage, and I put whatever I had in a locker at the, uh, at the Albert Pick transfer point, got a taxi, and went to the White House, presented my telegram, and got in, just like magic, and uh, went up to what I now know was the cabinet room. And uh, there were other people assembled, people who were active in the civil rights movement. And um, we sat and waited around a table for the president and uh, the vice president, Hubert Humphrey, to arrive. Well, as I sat there, really at the far end of the table, I still said to myself, now Lyndon Johnson probably doesn't know who I am or what I'm about, and I probably just, my name just probably just slipped in somehow and got into that. So the president came in, everybody stood up, he sat down, we all sat down, and we start to discuss this legislation, fair housing legislation. And the conversation was going around the table, and the president would call on first one person for a reaction and another person for a reaction. And then he stopped and he looked at my end of the table. He said, Barbara, what do you think? Well, I just, uh, in the first place, 
I'm telling you, I didn't know the president knew me, and here he's looking down here saying, Barbara, and then saying, what do you think? So that was my first exchange with Lyndon Johnson. I'm startled. I got myself organized, of course, not so that I wouldn't stammer, uh, since it is not uh, my uh, habit to stammer when talking. And I gave a response, and, and then this conversation ensued. That was my first contact personally with Lyndon Johnson. And there were others after that, but in terms of I would have to consider that our first meeting. And after leaving Washington, there was a story in uh, the newspaper, the Evans Novak column. And in that column, they mentioned my visit to the White House and stated that I had impressed the persons who were at the meeting, including the president, more than some of the persons who were familiar figures in the civil rights movement. Now, when you see that kind of an, an uh, indication in a national column, you know that it's a plant. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a White House plant. So I would say that that was an indirect uh, encounter with Lyndon Johnson. Did you, what impression did you have of Lyndon before you met him personally? Did you have ever, you know, as you, as he was, when he became president and you were in Houston uh, in the Texas legislature, did you have any idea, any impression of what kind of man he was after he was appointed, I uh, became president with the assassination? Well, you've got to understand this. I worked very hard for the election of the Kennedy-Johnson ticket in 1960 in Houston and I was very enamored with John Kennedy and when he was assassinated I was devastated by that and it took me a while to really focus on Lyndon Johnson the president but once I got over my devastation and realized that this is a man who is large enough to care about all people and attended to that, I then started to feel warmly towards Lyndon Johnson. And that is the feeling which grew in me as he performed during his presidency. Is that because of some of the some of the legislation that he proposed and as a president it became law? You could uh, you could say that a man who could uh, exercise power on behalf of people with the aplomb and finesse which Lyndon Johnson could that got my attention, and certainly I was impressed being now a fledgling politician myself. I was certainly impressed with how this man could get things done for people, and uh, that continued to grow in terms of impression. The, the, uh, see the positive, I'm saying the positive impression that you have, Johnson, as personally, was that feeling imminent in the Texas legislature by Johnson and while you were in it? Did you notice anybody, that, was there a groundswell for respect for Johnson? By we all loved Lyndon Johnson, and, and the, as members of the Texas State Senate, we didn't know him very well. Most of us did not have one-to-one -one, uh, encounters or contacts with him, but he was certainly well-respected and very highly regarded by my colleagues in the Texas Senate, and he was our number one Texan at, at all times. Uh, that was quite clear. Okay. In the meeting that you had in Washington when you attended, who, I noticed in the book it mentions that you had the meeting and there were quite a few people there in the biography. Who, mm -hmm. who, were, who were some of the other leaders who were, there, who were present? I remember Dorothy Height, the uh, 
president of the National Council of Negro Women, there was um, Urban League and NAACP representation there. It seems like, I'm not sure Whitney Young was there, but they were people that I had seen on the, in the civil rights movement in the past. And, and in terms of their names, I guess I remember Dorothy Height's name because I re remember the name of a woman who was there. Were you, were you, were you two the only women that were there? I don't recall. Oh, okay. was, it, was it a pretty large group? I'd say it was, say, 20 people, 15, 20 people. The, uh, the, the, the what, what y'all what, what you discussed in that meeting did it become a, as you suspect as you wanted to but did it become a reality? it became law yes it did indeed and uh, that must have been the uh, Fair Housing Act of around 1968. Let me ask you, you know, I noticed in your, in your in your efforts to be to be elected to the Texas House of Representatives, uh, House of Senate, well, you ran for the House, I think, first. And I ran for the House two talk. times and was defeated two times. Now, do you, the uh, legislation, within, do you think the legislation passed under Johnson's administration had an effect on the redistricting of Houston to the effect that it did provide you the opportunity to run in a single member district. And that so, I, I'm that was the action of the courts. The courts mandated redistricting of the Texas Senate and that's what was uh, possible made uh, getting a Senate seat possible for me. Okay. Baker versus Carr, the redistricting decision. Which would be a, which would be a judicial matter. That's correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I know so when, when you also when you uh, you had a you had a fundraiser or something in in Houston and uh, as a picture of you and Lyndon Johnson uh, embracing on the, and he, I think he said if you ever needed him to come to your aid, he would come. So uh, that is true. So you, 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 the, the friendship from the point that you went to Washington for that meeting grew from that. Well, it certainly did grow from that. Uh, the uh, president, President Johnson, and. Uh, asked me, on another occasion, President Johnson called my house and asked me to serve on a presidential commission. He was establishing and did set up a commission on income maintenance programs. And he called my house one day, which uh, upset my mother to no end. I mean, upset her in a good way. She just she just couldn't quite handle the President of the United States being on the telephone at her house. And uh, when I, I walked in from some place and she said, almost breathlessly, the ranch is calling. I said, the ranch is calling. She said, the President is calling from the ranch. And so I got on the phone and I said, hello, Mr. President. And that, that is when... Uh, President Johnson asked if I would serve on the Income Maintenance Commission, and uh, he told me who else would be on it. And it was, uh, I thought, uh, a, a worthy thing to do, and so I did serve on that commission, and that was a second conversation that I had with uh, the President when he did establish that commission. Now, our work product was, it's almost now an embarrassment, we were so low in the uh, figure which we set out for the minimum income necessary to bring families out of poverty, which I think was $4,000 or, and, uh, but we, we did, uh, we did do that, and it was the idea which was so important that the president was uh, stating and setting out for us that uh, Wilbur Cohen was a member of that uh, commission. And what we, were, what we were doing was laying the groundwork for a 
minimum income guarantee for poor people so that uh, people would no longer be poor. So we did do that. And that was, as I said, an occasion of conversation with the president. The president uh, was invited to Houston for a fundraiser. Not a fundraiser. Well, I think we were retiring a debt for Senator Ralph Yarborough because Senator Ralph Yarborough always had a debt. <laughs> and the president came to, to Houston to uh, speak at a function to retire that debt. And uh, there was great discussion. I was involved in the planning of this dinner. And there was great discussion of who will introduce Lyndon Johnson. And when the president was heard from, he said, I want Barbara Jordan to introduce me. And, and that's what I did. And that was the occasion when uh, after that, after that dinner, Lyndon Johnson held my hand in both of his as only he could do and said, if ever you need anything from me, money, morals, or chalk, I'll never forget it, just call. So when I decided to run for the Congress, I said, well, I'm going to call it in. I'm going to call it in because money is needed at this time. And that's when I uh, called uh, the president who had left office at that time and told him about my plans to run for Congress and asked if he would come for a fundraiser. And he said, yes. And as, as I, I knew he would because he wouldn't have said that if he hadn't meant it. He, well, he didn't have a habit of just promising people things like that. And that was a strong statement. And so he... Uh, did come to Houston to this fundraiser which we had at the Rice Hotel when I was raising money for uh, my race for Congress. And we had a hotel ballroom filled with people. And when the we kept it quiet that the president was coming, but when the word got out that he would be there, uh, the president's buddies thought they'd better ante up. <laughs> And they did. <laughs> Very profitable. <laughs> yes. It was a fine dinner. So I was standing there at the door when the president uh, came in, and he gave me that big bear hug, and that's the picture that you see. Yeah. Did you ever go to the ranch? You ever go to the ranch while he was here? To one of the, one of the barbecues or whatever that he is famous for, famous for? No, I did not. I did have an occasion to go to the ranch while the president was still alive. My sorority, Delta Sigma Theta sorority, had its national convention meeting in Houston. And we asked the delegates from all over the country, what would you most like to do when you come to Texas? And they said, we would like to go to the LBJ ranch. Well. Uh, the sorority then turned to me and said, well, you'll have to pull it off. And so I again called and asked the president if the Delta Sigma Theta sorority could come to the ranch for a visit. And of course he said yes. So we all piled and got on an airplane, and we came to Austin, and then we got a bus from the Austin airport to the ranch, and Lyndon Johnson personally toured those 30 or 40 women around the, the ranch house. And that was an experience that they'll never forget. None of us will ever forget it. But he took us into the nooks and crannies of his house on the ranch. And I am sure that Lady Bird would not have approved, but he took us into his restroom. <laughs> and uh, he <laughs> Just, this is where I shave, you see. <laughs> but even the women just loved it, and we all just loved it. And, uh, you know, he was a, he just was a real charmer like that. <laughs> yeah, I've heard you. I, I never saw him, I never met him, but I did come here when they had the symposium about a little before he passed. Yes, the Civil Rights Symposium. Right, I got pictures of, in fact, you too on stage. With yes. Him. And, uh. I know he's... Yep, that, your, that briefcase is hiding a picture I have, which I took with him. 
at that symposium. So he was very accessible. I mean, you felt you could get to him pretty as accessible as a, as a president could be to anybody. Else. I never had any difficulty getting through to Lyndon Johnson. I can't say that about every public figure <laughs> that I've tried to contact, but I can say that about Lyndon Johnson. I think he comes across real yeah, well with uh, a number of people that I've had a chance to meet mm -hmm. who had a chance to meet him. Yes. And then there's Lady Bird. Is she is it as as uh, accessible or as nice as he? Oh, she is. She is the most gracious lady, and I I'm I just. I mean this very sincerely. I see Lady Bird periodically now. We serve on the uh, Texas Commerce Bank Shares Board together. And she is very gracious. She is very accessible. And she is willing to be of whatever assistance she can be. She remains a very strong supporter of this school, the LBJ school. And we are the better for it. Uh, in the in the line of, of civil rights, what, what, what would be your experience with the uh, I know as I think I recall the struggle. I know you had some you met some of the same resistance I met because I'm from Texas. Also, I know in your book you mentioned some of those. Uh, when when things begin to change, I guess in the 60s, 64, and after Johnson became president or whatever. When you went to Congress, uh, did you? Did you have a mission in mind of trying to deal with civil rights? I know you were appointed to uh, what committee? Judiciary. Judiciary committee. But did you have any other? Did you was that, was that your goal to, to to work in civil rights or to just go and try to serve the people from your district? My goal was to uh, go to Congress and be a good member of Congress, and yes, to serve the people of my district. But I did not see myself as representing particularly nor specifically the interests of black people, but I knew that whatever I did, that was representative of the interests of black people. You don't have to focus on that specifically nor stridently. You just have to be there. And when you are there, black people are represented. I agree. You I agree with that? I agree 100% with that. I like that statement. I'm not supposed to say very much when you do it. <laughs> But I like that. Did, did you find uh, operate, operating in the Texas legislative, legislation, legislature, I know it's different, but how was it different from the Texas and the, and the National Congress? If I could have stayed in the Texas Senate and been assured that whenever I got ready to go to Congress, I could go, I would have stayed in the Senate and not run for Congress when I did. But it was redistricting, the 1970 census redistricting, that made it look like uh, a time that I could go to Congress. And I knew that if I didn't go then, I would have to wait a long time because we, we keep people in office in Texas a long time. So I, in terms of contrast, I enjoyed being in the Senate. Once I cut through the uh, maleness of the Texas State Senate and their view that I was somehow going to be a disruptive force rather than a helping force, when I cut through that and formed friendships, I mean, genuine friendships. Some last now with the members of the Texas Senate. That was a very pleasant experience for me. We didn't agree politically on practically anything. There were there are 31 members of the Texas Senate and there are 11 who were viewed as the, quote, liberals in a Texas mode. But I got along with them and I liked them. And they were real folk, and you knew where they were, you knew where they stood, uh, you didn't have to guess about that. Then you go to Washington. That atmosphere is so rarefied and large that it becomes, it becomes very difficult 
to really get down to the core, the heart of a person, where they really are, the reality of a person. So if I were to draw a comparison and contrast, I would say that the members of the Texas Senate with whom I had encounters were genuine, humane, and real, and loyal. And I would say that the members I encountered in the Congress of the United States had more of a tendency to posture and engage in rhetoric and spin a web or a cocoon around them so you never knew which face you had on any given day. It was not easy to get through to the heart and core and soul that I'm talking about I could experience quite easily with my fellow senators. Now, Washington is, is a different... Uh, it's a different mix. There are 31 senators. There were 435. That's quite, uh, that's quite a difference. And so it is that difference which I suppose accounts, the difference in size, which accounts for the unreality of some of it. Now, of course, in Washington, I formed some close friendships, but not as many as I did as a member of a small body, the Texas Senate. Did, in, in, in the uh, National Congress, were the state uh, members of Texas in the House of Representatives, were they, did they form a coalition or some kind of a... Very cohesive. Very cohesive. We used to have lunch together each Wednesday. That's a tradition which was started under Sam Rayburn. And uh, we would have lunch each Wednesday in what, we, what they call the Speaker's Dining Room. And Sam Rabin started, and it still goes on. It went on as, as long as I was there, and uh, it goes on now. Now, before I got there, a woman had never attended a Texas luncheon, Texas congressional luncheon. But when I got there, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have to pass any resolution. They just knew that I would be there. And so I, I was there. You've had the opportunity to break a, a number of... Uh barriers I, I noticed in, uh, uh, in all your, I guess in your, in your whole life this mm -hmm. and uh, I noticed that no one, you don't, you don't project those out as, as the, the first of this and someone else picks that up. Mm -hmm. And I think based upon what I read, a lot of this comes from your grand grandfather, Ed, Johnny mm -hmm. Ed Patton. Right? Yes. Would that you is correct. Speak, speak to how you think what his philosophy was and how it affected you too, because it seemed like you've, from what you, the first of the book it says, it, you've kind of he told you to be independent and be, be your mm -hmm. own person. Do you want to say anything about how that has stood you in this day to achieve some things? That you well, know? the uh, the good thing about the lesson of independence and being one's own person, which I got from my grandfather, the good thing about that is. I never had to apologize for whatever I was doing. I, I was not, I was not self-effacing. Now, some people may say that that's bad, but I always figured that if, if he said that I was to be my own person, that I could just go out there and be it, uh, which I did do. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't look back, and I didn't look around for excuses for non-achievement. I just decided that uh, what one wants to do, one proceeds to do it. That can be a, that can be a dangerous kind of an attitude to have because I find myself wanting to lay that on everybody else in the world. I want to say that uh, now, well, those be those, that teenager who can't find a job and say he's so down and out, I want to look at him and say, look, you, you know, you're your own person. Just get out there and do it. That doesn't work for everybody. And that's, uh, I, I have to realize that and I have to remind myself that it worked for me, but it does not work for everybody. How did you, uh, how would you, I know, how would you uh, relate your experiences at Texas Southern 
<clears throat> not the groovy grill experiences, but the te Texas Southern <laughs> with uh, with uh, Boston. Oh, Texas Southern uh, gave me a a general good basic I almost said remedial education Texas Southern gave me a fairly good hand on the basics reading and writing and I didn't do much thinking and that was what was lacking that's what was missing so when I got to Boston I didn't have any trouble reading and writing but I did have trouble thinking and I would say that um, law school in particular is a good uh, vehicle for encouraging thought. And I just, I don't know why I did not have much of an experience with that at Texas Southern, except that I didn't have to do much thinking. I was I was doing all right. I could always make A's, and that's what counted it to do that. So it didn't make any difference whether I did any thinking. Uh. That's pretty well said. I like that. Do you, do you, think, do you think the experience at Boston and for, so you saying that law give you a, a, a lot of critical ability to do a lot more critical? Well, it, it does that. indeed. It does indeed. I recommend the legal education for organizing one's mind. It's good at that. You know, I think you've heard this before, and I'm going to say it again. I haven't said it to you, I'm going to say it. I think that you really made every black, black person, and I think the majority of Americans, proud when you served on the judiciary, on the Watergate thing. I, Wonderful. I know the state, that the, uh, the night that you made your, your remarks, I think that if the rating was been posted, I think you would have Ready with the Super Bowl. Well, I can only tell you this. Thank you for the compliment. But I can tell you this, that wherever I travel, no one has forgotten that speech. I think you're a critic. I mean, now, this is not, not a good thing. Right? No, I think you, you, what you did on that was just outstanding. I think the people were able to see, to cut through all the malaise and other stuff, reference to what Nixon may have done to get to what the law says, what we're here about, what we're you know, about to do. How did you, uh, after that happened, did that, were you, uh, I know you were bombarded by people to, to, for you to come and do certain mm -hmm. kinds of things for them. I still am. But, okay, personally, how, do you, how did you feel about it? Well, I felt that I was taking part, I was participating in a very important historical event and I knew that I had to, if I can get into the vernacular, I had to have my stuff together. And uh, that I would not, I had, there were, you know, I wasn't the only black person on the Judiciary Committee. Charlie Rangel was on. But at the time when we started the uh, impeachment proceedings, Charlie would say, well, I know he's guilty. I'm ready to vote impeachment. I said, you can't, can't do it that way. We've got to get through the evidence. He said, I don't need the evidence. I said, well, no, we, uh, we, uh, we've got to get the evidence and, and make sure. And so that's why I patiently went through the evidence until I was clear in my own mind that uh, that was the thing which had to be done. And uh, it was uh, the attorney, John Hill was the attorney general of Texas at the time, and, and John Hill said to me one day, he said, I told people before you came on television to, to give your statement about Richard Nixon's, Nixon, I said, Barbara will have her statement based in fact and law if she has to go back to Moses. <laughs> so so I, I told him, that's absolutely right. And so that's, uh, I, I, no one questioned uh, that it was the right thing to do. Now, I, the letters I got were overwhelming. I'd say I got maybe a dozen letters from people who didn't agree with me. But you contrast that to the hundreds upon hundreds who said that. 
that did it for me. You were, you were drafted as, as a candidate for president, I think. Did you buy some? Oh, well, some terrible. people try to. Oh, people, people get carried away. <laughs> did, did, did you, uh... Now, I don't know how much long, many questions, more questions you have, but I really need to okay. conclude. All right. Uh, let me ask you one, one other question. Your political aspirations, I know you... Do uh, you have any, any any more political aspects? Would you go back to the Senate if it was possible? To no, Texas no, I've, I've done that now. I don't need to to re to rerun my life. I need to just move on from this point, and and that's what I'm doing is is moving on from this point. I'm I'm enjoying teaching. I'm I'm developing into a pretty good professor, and if I uh, stick around here long enough, I'm going to be a very good one, and that's what I want to do. I want to uh, thank you for the. On behalf of the LBJ Oral History uh, Collection for giving us this uh, 